Well, good morning and greetings in the name of our risen Lord and Savior. He is risen. He is risen risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'd like to begin by reading Psalm 145 and setting our minds on our Lord like this. It reads, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. And Psalm 145 ends like this. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please read the silent prayer as Michael plays this prelude for for us. May the Lord bless you as you worship him today. Amen.
Please rise for our invocation. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord our God, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to his glorious name. We shall proclaim your love and faithfulness in the morning. Let's take a moment of silence for personal reflection. We continue. Sometimes our words and actions show how we are salt for the world, but then come those moments when we lose our flavor and our way. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Let us confess our sins to our Lord, God, so we might be restored and forgiven. Great, Great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. It is God's desire that we be holy, as He is holy. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. The Lord is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. What good is it if we say we love all people, but we give special treatment to a few? God calls us to love others as deeply as we love ourselves, with no strings attached. What good is it if we say we want God to show mercy towards us, but are quick to judge others. God calls us to forgive our sisters and brothers, to let mercy triumph over judgment. Father, you you ask us to speak out against injustice, and we whisper because we're afraid someone might hear us. You ask us to see the pain and poverty around us, but we, we close our eyes. You tell us that everyone and each one is created in your image, yet we persist in noticing the differences between us and others. We stand before you, stripped of our pretensions and pride, for nothing we do or say do not can be hidden from you. It is true. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It judges the attitude and thoughts of the heart exposing us for what we are. Great is God's mercy to all who call upon Him. There is a righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. God presented Jesus Christ as a sacrifice of atonement for sin, and so all who believe are justified freely by His grace. You're forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of the lessons. This first reading, this first lesson from the Old Testament is from the book of Zechariah, chapter 9. And chapter 9 reveals God's saving work. And this passage looks forward to the coming of Christ 500 years later. It reads like this. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, 
I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now, I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson from the New Testament is in Romans chapter 7. And in this passage, the Apostle Paul contrasts love of God's word with our inherent sinfulness. The solution is Jesus Christ. Paul writes this, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For, what I, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I agree. Amen. Let us rise for the reading of the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson is from chapter 11 of the gospel of Matthew. Uh, Jesus begins uh, in this little section with a personal prayer to the Father. But the real answer to Paul's question about wanting to do good but cannot do it on his own is indeed found in Jesus Christ, and he begins to tell us how in this text from Matthew. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. may be seated for the singing of the message hymn.
grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us share the text that's printed for us this morning. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Well, these words of Jesus are very popular. You know, come unto me, all who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's almost as popular as John 3.16. Let me tell you, this was not an easy text. I must have read this text, I don't know how many times this week, to try and figure it out. It's not easy. I struggled with it all week. What kind of rest is Jesus talking about? Is it rest from physical labor? Is it rest from the ordinary burdens of life? Because we know there are burdens in life, illness, financial burdens, family burdens, ordinary results of just living the human life? Well, the answer is no. I should have seen it at my first reading. But you know which is the one word that's key? Souls. Souls. The key word is rest for your souls, not life. It's a spiritual issue, not physical. Jesus is talking of rest from the labor of trying to obey Jewish laws and rules even today for current man-made rules that people try to develop or know so that they can develop a way to earn God's love and a place in heaven. Look, Paul's right in our epistle lesson. It's in our human nature to want to do good. We want to be good, especially in times of social instability. The entire Jewish religious system was a work-righteous religion, and it was designed to help people be good. The Jewish religious leaders developed over a thousand extra rules just to help you keep the Ten Commandments. They really wanted to help you be good. They were designed to help you keep the Ten Commandments, and thus, by your own efforts... Ah, that was the problem. By your own efforts, you could please God. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 7. I want to be good. I can't. So the Jews said, well, we'll we'll give you lots of extra rules that help you be good. Now, there were kosher rules about life and food. Rules about whom you could associate. For example, kosher meat from specific animals, not all, must be prepared in a specific way and may never be served or eaten at the same meal as a dairy product. Furthermore, all utensils, plates, cups, silverware used to, in the preparation of a meal or used while eating that meal must be kept separate, even down to having separate sinks in which to wash them. Also, grapes or milk or cheese made by non-Jews could not be eaten. Jewish men could not touch the hand of a woman in public, nor even talk to one. A Jewish physician could not touch a non-Jewish person who was ill. You could not even walk on the property of a non-Jew. You had to say certain prayers throughout the day. And they had to be said in a certain way and with certain words. And on the Sabbath, you couldn't walk more than three quarters of a mile. You couldn't sew. You couldn't cook. You couldn't wash out a cup or a plate. You could not write. For that would work. There are more, but time is short. But I like what Matthew has done for us. Matthew has really laid out a very interesting situation to explain to and answer the question who is Jesus it sort of begins when the disciples were with Jesus uh, on a lake and a storm comes up and uh, Jesus said be still and the waves became calm and says the men in the boat with him the disciples 
asked, well, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Uh, it's making you think a little bit. And then all of a sudden there's a healing of a demon-possessed man. There's a healing of a paralytic guy. Uh, this one is let down through the roof. You know the story. Then Matthew's called to be a disciple. Then there's the healing of a, a, a sick woman and a little dead girl is raised to life. And then uh, he heals a person who's blind and could not speak. All of that's in chapter 8, 9, and then 10. He says, well, I'm going to send out the disciples and they have the power to do the same thing that I did. And we've been over that chapter a couple of times. And then we come to chapter 11. John the Baptist is arrested and soon will be killed. And now we come to where we are today, where Jesus is saying a prayer and says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, learn from me, I am gentle, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then he gets to chapter 12. Chapter 12 says that Jesus was in the grain fields and his disciples just grabbed a head of wheat and went like that. Oh, I can't do that. That's work. And the Pharisees caught him. And challenge him. Well, by the end of the chapter, he goes into the uh, synagogue, teaches. There's a man there with a withered hand. He says, stretch out your hand. And he did. And he was healed. But the Pharisees thought, oh, you can't do that. That's work. It's the Sabbath. Let him come back on Monday or Saturday, Sunday, whatever day. That's not the Sabbath. But he healed him. And it says, the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill him. Dallas Willard, in his book, Divine Conspiracy, writes, the Jewish laws that the people rubbed up against every single day was not the law of God. It was a list of religious rules, very harsh, and oppressive in application. Ultimately creating a religion that judged who was acceptable to God and who was not. These are spiritual burdens that Jews believed that they had to keep in order to please God and receive His blessings. The result? You never measured up. The burden was too heavy. You always failed. One of our one of our members a few years ago told me, he said, you know, I took every job in the church I could take. I took all the offices on the church council. I volunteered at the church whenever there was anything to do. I worked hard at my job because I was trying to please God and earn something from Him. And then I realized it's grace. True story. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He said, yes, the law of God is good, but we're not saved by keeping the law. We cannot. Jesus said, do you think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets? No, I have come to fulfill them. And because he did, we should then find ourselves yoked to him. Look at the picture on the bulletin cover. It's a nice little yoke there that was used, uh, still used today in various parts of the world. Jesus is not promising that the burdens and the trials and the sufferings of life will be removed, but he said, you need to believe that you cannot earn God's love and forgiveness by keeping the Ten Commandments, which we know we can't. So he invites us in this text to be yoked to him because he's already obeyed all of the law. And Jesus knows that as human beings, we really want to be good. We hunger to be good, but we cannot find our way. The hundreds of thousands of rules the Pharisees offered didn't work. Just like our friend, who's a member of our church, found out just doing everything possible to church and doing all things did not earn him that peace inside. It was the grace of God. In Acts chapter 10, don't lose the cover, I'm coming back to it. In Acts chapter 10, there's a story about Peter, who was uh, given a vision by God regarding kosher rules of what was allowed to eat. 
He went up uh, the second floor of the building he was staying at. He was hungry. He wanted something to eat. And so they were fixing the meal downstairs. And while he was up on the roof praying, he had a vision. If you know the story, the story is that God dropped down a sheet with all kinds of animals in it on display before Peter and God said, oh, Peter, rise up, kill and eat. He, of course, objected. He knew Jewish rules. God did it three times to him. God was breaking down walls of prejudice, Jewish rules about who was in the kingdom and who was out, who was to be excluded. Peter just couldn't keep his mouth shut. So when he goes to the house of Cornelius, what is the first thing he says? You know it's against our law. I can't come into your house. I cannot associate with you. Come on, Peter. You didn't have to say that right off. But he did. But then he goes on to say, God showed me that it was a yoke, a burden of prejudice, that all my learning was wrong. Peter then enters the house and tells the story of Jesus, his life, death, resurrection. The Gentiles all accepted Christ, were no longer outside the kingdom of God. They were to be accepted. In Acts chapter 15, later on, the debate doesn't go away. There's a big meeting in Jerusalem. And the Pharisees are still arguing that you have to keep some of these Jewish rules. And Peter finally says, no, why are you testing God? Why put the, on the necks of these new Jewish disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers could even bear? No, the Gentiles and Jews are saved by grace and grace alone. And so in our text, Jesus is saying, take my yoke and learn from me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The metaphor of a yoke still calls us to attach ourselves to Jesus. Obedience to the words of Jesus are necessary if we call ourselves followers of Jesus. So how does this work? When two animals are yoked together, like you see on your bulletin cover, they always tended to yoke them together to plow a field or to pull a load but they almost always took an experienced ox or other kind of animal and paired them with one who was inexperienced so they would learn Jesus is simply asking us to put his yoke up on us and let us accept his obedience that he's already done he's done the hard work He's carried the weight. He's carried the burden of the commandments. His obedience was perfect. And so if we are yoked to him, then that obedience is transferred to us and we find it easy to do good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do. Paul writes, God has made peace. God has made harmony. He's brought about acceptance with himself. It's possible through the obedience of Jesus and his death on the cross. Jesus has made peace available by his blood, which was shed on the cross. And now God has reconciled you as his friends through his physical death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation, if you continue to be yoked by Jesus. The Greek philosopher Plato once described human beings as leaky jars. Why does he use the term leaky jars? Because he said, as soon as we think we finally filled up our life and we're content with something, after a while that something doesn't seem to be enough to make us content and satisfied. And we start feeling empty again. And so then we go out and we look for something else to make us content. We always are journeying and looking for something beyond the horizon, that elusive oasis of contentment. And then we're always disappointed. The Pharisees created man-made rules, the kosher rules. They were meant to make one feel content and happy, but you never arrived. The law is a burden, and we cannot keep man-made rules. It was the same burden Martin Luther felt as he tried to please God. He wrote, I was indeed the most pious monk ever. And if ever a monk could obtain heaven by his monkish works, 
It was I. I fasted. I took pilgrimages. I did all of the things, even to beating my own body because I was burdened that I was breaking the commandments and I could not please God. This yoke of the monastery and the church and rules left Luther hopeless until he discovered grace. There is a righteousness from God apart from the law and man-made rules. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we are justified by grace through the redemption of Jesus Christ. The choice is yours. Jesus said, you can take my burden and share my yoke. Or you could keep trying to do something on your own. The commandments are still valid. Yes. They help create a civil society. We're expected to keep them. We are to obey them. The words of Jesus, to love God, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to be good managers of his earth. These still remain. But when we're yoked to Jesus, it's all his grace and all of his work that has been done and it transfers to us. And we pull with him as we do the good works he's asked us to do. So be yoked to Jesus. It's a partnership. And you will find rest, not in your life, but rest in your souls. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, your goodness is overwhelming. And we ask that you would continue to enable us to remain yoked to you and your obedience as it carries us through our journey of life. In your name, amen. amen. Let us stand and uh, confess our faith. We, oh, sorry. I did again. <laughs> we have to sing first. To sing first. So let's uh, rise and sing the offertory hymn, Father Welcomes. confession of faith together in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, 
begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was the man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead. Life is the Lord God. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you ensure that the birds of the air are fed and the lilies clothed in splendor. Deliver us, Lord, from worry with the consolation that you know what we need and that for Jesus' sake, we are much more valuable than they. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, fill our homes with your word and grace. Be the companion of those who are alone. Strengthen husbands and wives. Bless parents and grandparents as they teach the faith to their children and grandchildren. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, give our nation's leaders wisdom and integrity to preserve peace, promote what is good, and defend against violence and wickedness. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, be with all who are weary and heavy laden with the hardships of this life. Give comfort to all who suffer illness. Console them with the knowledge that your yoke is easy and your burden is light and that in you they will find rest for their souls. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, bless all who receive Christ's body and blood in this communion with penitent hearts, trusting in your promises. Lord, in your mercy. And we give thanks to you, O Lord, for all those who have gone before us. We pray that you would preserve us in repentance and Christ's righteousness until we stand before you in glory. And Lord, we do pray for the Peterson family with the loss of Marjorie. Guide them, Lord, and protect them in this time. Lord, in your mercy. It's into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated as we prepare for the service of the sacrament.